With respect to Jeremiah 31, it is quite possible that when Jeremiah, that Jeremiah, when speaking of the people in exile, may have spoken of the exile's families in danger, and God later comforts them and reassures them that they'll have descendants despite the misfortune. And I think that is the parallel that Matthew is drawing on within the context of his book. In both contexts, in Jeremiah 31, and in the context of Matthew, where Matthew quotes the verse itself, both the, fa the families in those contexts are in severe trouble. You have people in exile in Jeremiah 31 having their children massacred. Namely, the Jewish women are having their children killed off. But with respect to the subject of um, Matthew, it's speaking about women in Israel having their women, uh, sorry, having their children slain. There are interesting parallels here. King Herod tries to kill off the babies in order to prevent the Messiah from taking the throne of Israel. And notice interesting something here. Jeremiah 29, two chapters ago, it establishes that Jeconiah had already been taken into exile. And if one thinks about it, Jeremiah 31 talks about children in Ramah suffering, or at least families in Ramah suffering. It's quite possible that the, the devil was using, those, uh, using their oppressors to prevent the Messiah from being born, and to prevent the Messiah from being born to bring redemption. So it's quite possible that that's the parallel that Matthew is drawing upon in those contexts. Now we move on to the subject, the Nazarene prophecy, famously quoted by many Muslims and also by some of the rabbinic camps. So with that said, let's take a look at what Asher Meza has to say. This is not Messianic prophecy. By calling every verse that suits your needs Messianic prophecy, you only cheapen the reverence of our Bible. Another great problem is when scripture straight out lies. Matthew 2.23 states, And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So what fulfills what was said to the prophets, you will be called a Nazarene. My friends, I will donate $1,000 to anyone's favorite charity they can find that verse in Jewish scripture. But I warn you, it's going to be difficult. Why? Because the verse doesn't exist. They made it up. Stupid, huh? Matthew 2. Now, this is a very common assertion made about Matthew 2, verses, um, verse 23. But interestingly, this is what Answering Islam had to say on the subject. And they say much more, and I can post the article in the description so you can read more. But I want to read a section of it. This is what it says, quote, In discussions with the Christians on the validity and authenticity of biblical scriptures, Muslims will often raise the question about the statement made in Matthew 2.23. Quote, He went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he would be called a Nazarene. Unquote. The reason for this is that, quite correctly, Muslims state that there is no such specific prophecy in the Bible. Muslims state that there is no such prophecy in the Bible. They infer from this that, there, therefore, one or more of the following must be true. The Bible has been altered, all the sections of the Bible are missing, including the prophecy quoted in Matthew 2, or the New Testament is at least partially fabricated and therefore unreliable. However, on an examination of the Old Testament prophecies and the context and the form of the statement in Matthew 2 show that this is an inference, that show that this inference is in fact incorrect. Firstly, let us look at the way that which Matthew refers to the Nazarene prophecy. Quote, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, unquote. Note that the writer does not refer to a particular prophet or prophecy. This kind of reference is very rare in the New Testament. The general means referring to an, a fulfilled prophecy is to at least refer to the prophet, any devout Jew w would know which one, or else to name the prophet who gave the, gave the prediction. Unquote. There are several other things that they say in the article, but I think that's about it for... Um, that's it for the time being. 
but it's very interesting what has been said. You will also find a similar kind of statement, not so much made by Matthew, but made by Jesus, recorded by Matthew in Luke 24. This is what he says. Quote, he said to them, this is what I told you while I stood with you. Everything must be fulfilled what is written about me in the Lord Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what it is, is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Unquote. Matthew 20, sorry, Matthew 2, 23 and Luke 24, 44 to 48 do what they do is this. They are not claiming in those contexts that there is a verbatim statement word for word. What they're actually claiming is that the scriptures as a whole are referring to these things. Or rather, they're referring to some passages collectively. In Matthew 2.23, Matthew is thinking of several passages. He is thinking of a number of passages in total. He is not sa saying that there is an actual statement that says he will be called a Nazarene. That's not, there's no statement like that as pointed out. He's simply making the point that the scriptures talk about it. He's not talking about a verbatim statement. It's the same thing in Luke 24 verses 44 to 48. It's the same thing that Jesus did there. Let's carry on. They made it up. Stupid, huh? Matthew 2 verse 12 through 14 states, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child, his mother, and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord has said to the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Is this a distortion of prophecy or what? This verse is found in Hosea 11, which states, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. What does that have to do with Jesus? And yet, Christian apologists count this verse as one of those 300 prophecies he supposedly fulfilled. My friends, no Jew in their right mind will consider this a prophecy. Also, if Joseph, Mary, and Jesus had to flee to Egypt while Herod was slaughtering all males under two years old, why does Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 through 16 note that Jesus' cousin, John, John the Baptist, was also under two and survived without having to flee? Actually, Luke chapter 2, verse 21 through 39 states, they did not have to flee to Egypt, but remain for temple rituals. No slaughter of infants is even mentioned in Luke. My friends, the reason I'm reading these contradictions and distortions to you is because I want you to think, how would you react, being a Jew who has been faithful to the flawless words of Scripture, and suddenly you were confronted with the New Testament? How would you react? We know that God's Torah gives life. Why would a just creator give a people a set of instruction they cannot live by? If that is so, then he is not just and ultimately not God. What Christians typically ask Jews is, are you perfect? Do you keep the Torah 100% without ever sinning? Do you bring blood sacrifices to atone for your sins? Oh, you don't, you say? Well, then you're destined for the fires of hell, my friends. Now, this argument can only make sense to a Christian because Jews have not developed the concept of original sin. My friend, let me explain. In order to justify Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, Christianity had to assume that man needed a savior to save them from the fires of hell. The other alternative to salvation was to be able to keep the Torah perfectly without sin. Christians believe that because man sinned in the garden, he was destined to hell. And only through the all-powerful atoning sacrifice of Jesus is man able 
to righteously stand before a holy God. Judaism teaches that although man is prone to sin, he's not a slave to sin. In other words, when he does sin intentionally, repentance is all the atonement that is needed. I'll cover this issue in depth in my video titled, Biblical Atonement. A lot of issues to cover at this point. Let's deal with the Hosea 1. No, sorry. Let's deal with Hosea 11, verse 1. In the passage of Hosea, this is what it says. I'm going to read the uh, first. I think I'll read the um, verses 1 to 7. This is what it says. Quote, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to the Im images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk by taking them by their arms, but they did not realize it was them who, who, uh, sorry, they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with the cords of human kindness, with the ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bend, bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt, and will not Assyria rule over them, because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their eyes, it will devour their false prophets, and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me, even though they call me God the Most High. Or God Most High. I will by no means exalt them. Unquote. Now in this passage, God is speaking of the time he first called Israel out of, out of the land for servitude to him and to be his son. But in spite of this, the people of Israel rebelled and turned to Baal, Asherah, or whatever detestable deity they decided to worship. Some even tried including Hashem in the pantheon, which of course he would not accept, and rightly so he didn't. The point is, they were called to be his servant and proclaim his name among the Gentiles, and bring the world to himself through them. In the same way, Jesus was called out of Egypt by his Father in heaven to do his mission of redemption, of bringing the Jews and Gentiles into reconciliation with the Father by the vicarious death on the cross. This was the mission of Christ in the will of the triune God from eternity. After being sent to earth, Jesus, God the Son, was sent for service by his Father, God the Father, to carry a mission and a function and to serve him. Just as Israel was called to serve God, the Son himself was called for a mission by the Father. That is the, what is being put across in these passages by Matthew in his Gospel. Israel being the prototype of the Messiah with respect to servitude to God. The next objection that Asher Meza brings to the table is the subject of why John the, ba of John the Baptist. And if you want to rehear his point, you can play the video again. You can play that part of the video again. But when you read the chapter of Matthew 2, sorry, when you read Matthew 2, Herod is told by the scribes what the specific location of the Messiah is and what clan he'll hail from, namely Benjamin of Rapha, and they quote from Micah 5.2. And I've written an article on this if you guys are interested. But essentially, that's, that is why John survives the massacre of the babies under two. John the Baptist did not live in Bethlehem. All it says in Luke 1.39, or rather what it says in Luke 1 as a whole, it doesn't say that Beth sorry, it doesn't say that John the Baptist was born in Bethlehem or even raised in Bethlehem. It just says that Mary visited a town where in the hill country of Judea that can be found in Luke 1 verse 39. It just talks about a town in the hill country. It is not Bethlehem. So as we can see, that's another objection by Arshamesa brought down. And of course, there is the subject of the two so-called discrepancies that have been... There are um, supposed discrepancies with respect to the accounts about going to Egypt or Nazareth. Sam Shamoon, in his article to Menj, has, met, has quoted the passages in question from Matthew and Luke. Specifically, he's quoted from Matthew 2, 1 to 16, and 19 to 23, and he's quoted from Luke 2, 21 to 24, and 39 to 40. This is what Sam Shamoon says in his article. He says, quote, 
Matthew provides us enough data to help us reconcile the two accounts. Herod's order to kill all children two years and under is a strong indication that the Magi did not arrive immediately after the birth of Jesus, but sometime afterwards. Otherwise, it would have been fo quite foolish for Herod to issue such a command, namely kill all who were two years and under in accordance with the time he learned for the Magi. It would have been quite foolish for Herod to issue a, such a command if Jesus were only an infant. We are not told how old Jesus was at the arrival of the Magi. He may have been a one-year-old or even 18 months. Whatever the age, it seems clear that the Magi's visitation didn't occur only days after Christ's birth. Luke, on the other hand, states that Jesus was still an infant when Mary, Joseph and Mary returned to Nazareth. Comparing two reports about different events that took place nearly two years apart, would anyone expect these two reports to be identical? In light of the preceding contra uh, considerations, it does certainly not take a rocket scientist to see that these verses are not at all contradictory or irreconcilable. Rather, it becomes easy to resolve Menge's alleged error. Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem to present the newborn infant in the temple. From there, they went back to their home in Nazareth. A short time later, the Holy Family decided to return to Joseph's ancestral hometown and Jesus' birthplace, namely Bethlehem and Judah. This is where Matthew picks up. When the Magi found Jesus, he was already up to two years old, being told in a dream about Herod's desire to kill the child. Joseph left his home and took his family to Egypt until the death of Herod, fearing that Herod's son, Archelaus, would search them out if they returned to Bethlehem, the Holy Family once again returned to Nazareth and settled there. Unquote. That covers the so-called contradictions between the subject of Egypt and Nazareth. Also, blood atonement, as a side note, was, a, was provided for you, Ashamaza, to compensate for the fact that you couldn't keep the law of Moses. It was compensation. That's what atonement is. Atonement means to compensate. That's essentially why you were given the sacrifices in the first place, to compensate for the fact that you couldn't keep the Torah. But even then, the sacrifices only covered your sin. They did not ex expiate or take away your sin, Ashamaza. That is another point that you need to take into consideration. The Messiah's death on the cross allows you to be cleansed of your sin by repentant faith and trusting in his finished work so that you can be righteous and clean in the sight of God. The fact that you cannot keep the Torah perfectly shows that we stumble. And for that matter, with respect to original sin, Genesis tells us, Bereshit tells us, that man's inclination is evil from his youth. That's why God destroyed the earth. Man was wicked. They weren't merely just prone to sin in a semi-Pelagian or Pelagian sense, they were men who were dead in transgression, who needed to be liberated. That is why God set about the plan of redemption in the first place. The Torah was presented to you to show how bad you are. It wasn't God playing a trick on you, and it doesn't mean that God is not God. Absolutely not. God is God. He is fair. He is just. But he gave the law to show you that you couldn't live up to his standard. The law is to show that you need someone to help you with a holy life. Yes, there are cases where people are blameless in the scripture, but they are righteous because of the merits of the Messiah. And of course, I quote from William Lane Craig in a, um article that I did a while back. By the way, guys, as a initial side note here. Keith Thompson has done a video as to why William Lane Craig should be not supported. So uh, I would recommend taking a look at that video. And by the way, my point in the Ellie Cohen article was long before William Lane Craig was long before the Keith Thompson video was ever released. Just to clarify, okay? I just thought I might put that point across. But anyway, um, those are the objections for now, and I hope to address more in the near future. Thank you guys for taking the time to watch these videos and I hope to address more of the talk in the future.